Okay. Well, welcome everybody to our February 20th, 2024 DV Mug Zoom meeting. I'm Peter Weiler. I'll be your host for today. And we'll follow our typical format of news, uh, an extra miscellany item, and then uh, a series of videos. It looks like there are a lot of them, but uh, over half of them are very short and the others are only mid-length. So I think we can fit them in. Let's get started. This week's news. You will find uh, this um, item in on the BBS uh, for DV Mug. It's in the folder. It shows the URLs, the links to these news items, where you can actually read the entire news piece, and that'll be helpful. And there also will be a similar item for videos showing the links to them. So they're there for your uh, use, and once you download them, you can click on the links within them. Our first news item is about another member of the old core design team for Apple, which was led by Johnny, now if I have his name right, I hope, Ivy. Uh, at any Hi, rate- I've. Ives, okay, uh, Johnny Ives, a uh, renowned designer who worked with Apple for a long time. He, he left in 2019, consulted with them, and now is gone for good. But more of the original design team are departing. Uh, Bart Andre is the latest, leaving after 32 years on uh, the design team. He was an industrial engineer and one of the leaders, one of the top lieutenants for uh, Ives. And uh, at any rate, this is, uh, we're just, just named a couple of those who have left. So the culture is changing and in Bloomberg, they're reporting on that, uh, whether this will be a problem at Apple, time will tell. Yeah, but he worked 32 years. <laughs> He's probably retired. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think that's quite likely. Um, but at any rate, um, we shall see. You know, Apple was always known for its uh, state-of-the-art design uh, and the way their products looked, and hopefully they'll continue to have compelling-looking products. So item two, Apple reveals a uh, artificial intelligence tool that can turn still images into animation. Um, I've experimented with animation myself back in the old days of film. I actually made a few of them, um, showed one at a DB Mug Film Fest involving Silly Putty, where you would take a picture of each frame within the video. And back in those days, there were 16 pictures per second. So it took a lot of individual frames to make up animation. Uh, when you're doing actual artwork, such as Disney's animations, uh, we're talking perhaps 30 frames a second uh, of incredible artwork. So again, it takes a lot of time. Now, evidently, uh, AI can do a lot of this work for you. So they're using a tool called Keyframer. It works with uh, what they call large language models or LLMs. And it uses, uh, well, chat GPT uh, version four is one example of what it can use to quite automatically turn images into animations. Um, so with the large language models, they can generate code from actual natural English language. So you can prompt, hey, make it look cool and take the work and change it to something hopefully that looks cooler. 
So 84% of the users who tested this uh, tool uh, using those semantic prompts said uh, the output was really quite worthwhile. I wonder what cool looks like. <laughs> well, I can't answer that, but uh, I imagine we'll be finding out. The third item, um, this is listed in the news area on uh, Mac World, but um, it's really more of a projection as to what's coming because Apple never tells you, well, we're building these A18 uh, and M4 chips and this is what they'll do. So um, it is people's best guesses to some degree. Uh, at any rate, um, Economic News reported that Apple is integrating artificial intelligence into its upcoming chips. And the next level would be M4s and A18s. Um, but they also intend to um, use the processing power of AI in some of its current processors, the M3 and A17. Um, what they believe is that the neural engines are going to be um, improved doing this. And that could be done through the number of cores or the speed of the processing, or even some new core functions that we haven't heard about yet. Um, so quite likely there may be an A18 Pro chip in your iPhone 16 Pro next fall. Um, the M4 might not appear until later in the year on a MacBook Pro or an iMac. So they also noted, uh, actually this article was written by Roman Loyola, uh, Loyola, that Apple hasn't released its last version of the M3 chip. So the M3 Ultra chip uh, is still to come out and that Apple might put some of that AI into its design as well. Any comments? So perhaps that 3 a.m. drunk call to your ex-girlfriend um, that you try to place, um, um, your phone will say, I don't think that's a good idea right now. I'm not going to place that call. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. The bartenders will be out of business. <laughs> so, miscellany. I uh, a debt of gratitude to Lee Wagner, who uh, conceived of having this as a separate category to our Zoom meetings. Uh, when something isn't quite news, but it's not a video, where do you put it? We'll put it into miscellany. And... This piece uh, was done by Sergio Velasquez of iDrop News, um, and it focuses on when is it time to upgrade your iPhone? And I imagine everybody out there at this meeting has an iPhone. Some of them might be getting long of tooth, um, but what should you be considering? And perhaps we all have thought of these 10 items that I'm going to show you, but it has them all together and it might help you make a decision as to whether to keep uh, stick with what you have or maybe upgrade to the iPhone 16 that comes out quite soon. So working from 10 down to one, upgrade when your iPhone doesn't get updates anymore when your iPhone doesn't support new apps, when your iPhone can't use new accessories, when your iPhone is just too slow, when your iPhone's battery doesn't last as long anymore, when your storage doesn't cut it anymore, and this might happen to several of us because iPhones are expensive and the cheapest way to get a new one is to 
just by the smallest amount of storage. Number four, when your iPhone is just too damaged, hopefully not quite like this one. Three, when your touch screen isn't as responsive anymore. Or when the features on your iPhone that you have aren't enough for you. And finally, when you're constantly repairing your iPhone. Any questions or comments? Okay. So let's move on to this week's videos. Again, here is the page you'll find on the BBS in uh, our DV mug folder. And those blue things are the links that you can click on once you've downloaded it, and it'll take you right to the videos. So you can watch them again whenever you wish. Starting with Recording keynote videos with you in them. Make yourself part of the movie. Hi, this is Gary with MacBose.com. Let me show you how you can create video presentations with yourself on camera using Keynote. MacBose is brought to you thanks to a great group of more than a thousand supporters. Go to MacBose.com slash Patreon. There you could read more about it. Join us and get exclusive content and course discounts. Now, I often get asked about my videos, how I put myself in the bottom right-hand corner of the video while I'm showing stuff on the screen. Most of the time when people want to do this, though, they don't want to do screen recording. Now, I'm using specialty software for this. But most of the time when people want to do this, they don't necessarily want to show the screen, but they want to show a presentation. Like, for instance, you've created a presentation, a keynote that has all sorts of information in it. And you want to create a video of that, but with your voice and with your image in a corner presenting these slides. You could do this pretty easily using only Keynote. The functionality is built into it. So let's start off here with a presentation. I've got a demo presentation here, and it's just a bunch of different slides. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to put myself on the actual slides. So let's say I don't have it here on the first slide. This is just the introduction. But here on the second slide I'm presenting, and I want to see myself here. The way to do that is to choose insert and then live video. And then you're going to see yourself using your webcam. So if this is a like a MacBook or an iMac, it's going to use your built-in webcam. On my Mac Studio, I'm using the Apple Studio Displays camera. Anything that you usually use as a webcam should show up here. So you're going to see yourself, and you can change the size of this. And you can, with it selected, go over to format in the sidebar here, and there's a section called live video. You can actually choose if you've got multiple cameras set up. You could scale like this, and you could choose a mask. So you don't need to do 16 by 9. Chances are you probably want to do square like this, or maybe circle like that. But you could even do custom, which is basically a rounded rectangle. So you can increase the corner radius and have it be something like that. You can also have the background removed. So you select this, and the background's removed. You could change the background, add a color or a gradient, or even bring in an image to use as the background here. I'm going to leave it as no color. So it's transparent here. You can actually see how I'm floating over the content. But I could make it something like, say, a black color here. If I wanted to make sure that I blacked out what was ever behind, you can also go to style and choose different styles here with borders. So I'll just do a line here, just a white line. Uh, and you can choose a shadow, you can do reflection, you can even make it semi-transparent if you want. So once you get a style that you like, you can reposition this. Note, if I double click, I go back into where I can adjust the zoom like that. And now I can bring this and put it where I want. Let's say I want it at the bottom left-hand corner. So you can tell it's actually showing me live here on video. Now, this is only on this slide. If I go to the next slide, it's not there. So what you're going to want to do is select it and copy and go and paste it on any slide you want. So I'll paste it on the second slide. I'll paste it on the third slide. But it doesn't need to be on every slide. Like, say this was a slide where I wanted everybody to focus on what was said, and I didn't want to have my image there. I could skip that slide. And I can go to this slide and have me be there. I can go and put it on a different location on this slide. So here I'm going to put myself at the top left. 
And then I'm going to go back, paste in, and it's going to paste into the bottom left there. So you can see I'm in different locations. You can even animate this. If I choose this slide and go to animate and add an effect and say magic move, you could see how it does a regular magic move like it would with any piece of text or shape or image, but it's doing it with this live video element here. So it's actually going to transition. It's going to do the magic move from here to here, making me animated on the slide. So now I can practice this. I can hit play and I could see what's going on here. I could start going through and there I am there. And I'm on the next slide, this slide. On this slide, I'm not there, but then I'm back here. I go to this slide, I'm at the top. I go to this slide, but you see the transition, the magic move happened. So I can set this all up in advance to show me where I want. Now, you could already use this to present. If you're presenting a large room, for instance, you can have your webcam set to be on you, and then your image will actually be up on the big screen as well as your slides. But you can also use this to record. So let's go back to the first slide. I go into play and you can see I can record slideshow. So let's go and record slideshow. And what I'm going to see here is I see a recording interface. I don't actually see it here on this screen. Let me go and switch. I've got two screens and the second one shows me my presenter display. And you can see at the bottom here, I've got the recording controls. So I will go in, I'm going to hit the record button and it's going to count me down. And now I can make my presentation. So I can go from this slide and it's recording my voice the whole time, but now it's recording video as well. And it keeps recording video on these slides. It's going to record audio here, but no video because I'm not using the video element. Then here it's back here. It's at the top and then it's animating and I'm still talking while it's animating. And then it's going to go on and I haven't placed the live video on any other of these. So I'm just going to hit the stop button and I've now got a recording and what I can do now is I could play back the recording. So now instead of play slideshow, I can play recorded slideshow and I'll actually play back the slideshow and watch it go here in this window. Now it's recording video as well and it keeps recording video on these slides. And now in addition to that, I can also go to file and then export to and export to a movie and you can select a slideshow recording or self-playing. You want to select recording, and it's going to use all the audio and video. And then I'm going to save that out and save it out here to the desktop. And it'll create the movie. Probably it's going to be longer for a real length thing. But when it's done, you're going to get this video file here. And I'm going to open that up here using QuickTime Player. And there it is. And I can play this back. So I can go from this slide and it's recording my voice the whole time, but now it's recording video as well. And it keeps recording video. And there you go. It's got everything in it. I can scrub through it. There's even the part where and it's, it's moving animating, and I'm still talking while and it's all built into the video. So now I can take this video file here, upload it to YouTube or share it with other people. And it not only has my presentation in it, but my voice and my video on the slides where I want it. So there are tons of possibilities here. If you ever see the videos on YouTube where somebody is explaining something, well, now you can do that too. Build out a presentation, create all the different slides, do all of the different things that you can do in Keynote, and then rehearse your presentation and then record it. Recording even allows you to stop the recording and then pick it up or replace a section of it later on. So you don't have to get it all right in one run and then export it as a video. And I've got your own explainer video or the presentation that you created for work or school in a format that includes you in the video. I hope you find this useful. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button below. Any questions or comments? Pretty neat. Yeah, I agree. Gary does have a great way to make those things uh, easy to understand. Anyway, the next video is entitled Why Villains Never Use iPhones. And it's by Greg Wyatt of Apple Explained. Um, this has to do with product placement. And most companies will actually uh, pay 
Hollywood uh, producers money to have their uh, items that they sell show up in movies. Uh, Apple has a different approach. Let's have a look. Product placement is common in movies and TV shows, with companies paying to have their brand prominently displayed or subtly mentioned by a character. But Apple takes a different approach. Instead of paying money to a studio, they provide products for free as props. That's how Modern Family used an iPad in an episode that aired two days before the product's release. But these free products come with stipulations, which are outlined in a legal document titled Guidelines for Using Apple Trademarks and Copyrights. Here you'll find rules like the Apple product is shown only in the best light, in a manner or context that reflects favorably on the Apple products and Apple Inc. It even describes the grammatically correct way to speak about their products. For example, a character's line should be, I bought two Macintosh computers instead of I bought two Macintoshes. And while the document doesn't explicitly say villains can't use Apple devices, Knives Out director Ryan Johnson did make it clear, saying they let you use iPhones in movies, but, and this is very pivotal, if you're ever watching a mystery movie, bad guys cannot have iPhones on camera. The reason is likely due to the villain's negative image, which Apple doesn't want associated with their brand. In fact, Apple doesn't even want their products to be used in a way that creates a sense of endorsement or sponsorship, likely again because it creates a negative image. Instead, their products should be presented naturally, just as they are in real life, since seeing a character subtly use an iPhone is a more powerful endorsement than hearing a character deliberately draw attention to it. And when you think about it, this is an incredible deal for Apple, since they benefit from and have control over product placement without even paying for it. This is because studios don't have much of a choice. They could have every character use Android devices, but I would feel pretty unrealistic considering how ubiquitous iPhones are in real life. So studios are forced to play by Apple's rules if they want access to their products. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and if you want to learn how I make videos like these, let me know by tapping the link in the comments. Any comments? Yes, uh, that's really interesting. So on Apple TV Plus shows, Apple produced shows, you'd see nothing but Apple products. You'd never see an Android phone or anything but a Macintosh. And um, there were even some, I remember some reviews even commented on, oh, come on, stop hawking your product. But I've noticed in more recent Apple TV Plus shows, you, you do see some Android phones and some and some Windows computers, but looking forward, I'll have to, and I thought, oh, okay, now they're diversifying in order to not have that complaint. But now I have to wonder whether, I have to look now to see whether um, those other products are being held by villains. <laughs> right. Well, maybe that lawsuit in, uh... Uh, Europe might have some reflection in what's going on. Anything else? Okay. This next uh, video is by Rich Bolin. We've seen lots of his work. Uh, but this one's a little bit different because uh, he takes a negative view. And what his focus is on is Siri. He calls it the downfall of Siri. Siri, do you hate my guts? Hmm. I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? That's what I thought. I don't normally make negative videos. In fact, I've never made a negative video. I just make videos on how to use your iPhone and iPad, including videos on using Siri. But if you've ever struggled with Siri like I have, then you know what this video is all about. I remember when Siri was first introduced back in 2011 on the iPhone 4S. I was really excited at the thought of asking my phone to call my wife or daughter and bam, it would just happen. And Siri pretty much complied with those requests. It was kind of a cool feature. But through the years, as Siri became more sophisticated, I frankly became more frustrated. And it wasn't just me either. Even the Apple team that was recently working on the Vision Pro headset thought Siri was so bad that they needed to create something from scratch to control their new gadget. 
you know, but honestly, I don't really care about any of that. What I care about is Siri doing the things I ask her to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the points of failure have gotten to be so many that it just drives me nuts. I've made a lot of videos on how to use the various apps on your iPhone and iPad, and I go through detailed processes showing how to create a quick note or create a reminders list or even a simple shortcut. And invariably, I'll get a comment or two from really smart viewers saying, hey, you can just ask Siri to do that, and they'd be right. But I've steered clear from that because I really try to take the frustration out of learning how to use your iPhone and iPad. And however frustrating it is to create a reminders list from scratch, it's way more frustrating to ask Siri to create the list and then have Siri fail. Let me tell you just a few ways Siri has failed for me recently, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I asked Siri to call my daughter, Lindsay, a thousand times, and Siri has made all of those calls. But recently, while I was walking Scout and wearing my AirPods, I asked Siri to call Lindsay. Siri replied, and I kid you not, Lindsey Graham is a senator from South Carolina. You can find out more about him on your iPhone. What? So I asked Siri again, and she gave the same answer. And then I asked Siri to call Lindsay using her full name, and she made the call. The next day, I asked Siri to call Lindsay, not using her full name, and she made the call. Totally inconsistent responses. I have an Apple Watch Ultra and a cellular plan for the watch, and I like to listen to podcasts when I walk Scout using my AirPods. So I ask Siri to play Mac Power Users Podcast, a podcast I'm subscribed to in the Podcasts app. Siri used to play the podcast, but now tells me the podcast is not in my Apple Music library. What? Of course it's not. It's a podcast, not music. I can ask Siri to play a podcast and she fails about half the time. Same words, same request. Sometimes Siri works, sometimes not. The inconsistency just drives me nuts. Recently, I asked Siri to play some smooth jazz music and she complied. I then asked her to turn up the volume and she did. I then asked her to stop. Siri did stop the music, but then said, there's nothing to stop here. Check your internet connection. What? I'm out walking and you're on a cellular connection. Yet another example of a Siri fail. I asked Siri if I had any appointments on my calendar and she said, working, working, and then just went silent. This happens literally all the time. Another constant Siri fail for me is with Apple Maps. This is just one example, but it's happened so many times that I've given up asking Siri for directions. I live in Raleigh and I asked Siri for directions to a local government office. Siri gave me directions to a restaurant in Houston, Texas. I am not kidding. Not just once, but multiple times. I finally pulled my car over. Jeez. Oh, Oh, sorry about that. Oh, but oh, I can identify. Oh, God. <laughs> My computer's going crazy with all that mentioning about SIRI. I didn't get that. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I apologize. I uh, Yes, it's your fault. There. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, do you hate my guts? Sir, I'm not sure about that. Actually, I agree. I disagree with almost everything he said. I've had no problems with Siri ever. Oh, I have. I, I, I do. I, I agree with you. I have no idea what this guy's talking about. Oh, and, I, you know, like sometimes I'll be talking in here and, and all of a sudden my home pod will start playing music that I don't want to hear. And I have to tell it to stop and then it won't stop. It'll say there's nothing to stop here. Uh, and uh, that's happened so many times. And and as I said earlier, I abandoned all of my mm -hmm. all of my Apple automatic uh, automations because they're just so inconsistent. And of course, they're activated by SIRI. Hmm. Just an aside, uh, I use a male voice for Siri. And I think that 
when they refer to Siri, they should they should call it it, not she. Correct. Yes, <laughs> is an inanimate object. <laughs> I like the female British voice. Me too. Uh, it is it is female because the default voice is Siri is a female when she speaks to you by default. But it is sure dumb, no matter what voice it has. <laughs> well, it seems like we get, we have a mixed review here. Uh, some people have <laughs> done very well with Siri and others frustrated. So uh, evidently Apple's working on uh, adding AI to Siri and maybe that's going to help. Well, I think that it's going to be an easy transition for Apple because they've had these neural engines in the new M, M series chips uh, from day one. And of course, this is what Intel is now saying, oh, well, we're going to in, include a neural engine in our processors to accommodate artificial intelligence. And same with, uh, oh, what's the name? There's another chip company that was talking about incorporating AMD. ASD, yeah, neural engines. Uh, and of course, Apple's had this all along, so I think it's going to be a much easier transition for well, Apple. Well, I could, I could, I could. Maybe I don't understand something, but it seems to me that Siri always has been AI. Uh, I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it is. I think it's a responsive. But search. how is that different it's from AI? It's not generative AI, but it's, but I mean, you can ask Siri, uh, you can ask Siri to perform something you can ask many different ways and it understands. Um, um, I, I think it's just a language recognition is artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think it's just a syntactical search engine because it doesn't create, you can't say to it, create, create a poem like you can with chat, uh, well, but that's generative AI. That's a different yeah. process, but it's still an earlier, a different kind of AI. Well, then the uh, the thing they sell at Christmas time, the one to turn on your lights, that's artificial intelligence? No, because that's just, I mean, that's just one trigger does one thing. It doesn't, but exactly where the dividing line is, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, there is the rub, you know, um, and probably AI of today is going to be terribly crude compared to what it will be in a year or two. Yeah. So, so we shall see what happens. Anyway, we better move on here. Um, as you all can guess, Ellen's going to be our next uh, uh, video on how to automatically delete verification codes in messages and mail. And I'll let her explain. In this video, we'll walk through how to keep your messages and email inbox clean by having your iPhone or iPad or even your Mac automatically delete those text messages and emails with verification codes. When logging into website or apps, you might receive a one-time code sent to your iPhone via text message or email these messages and emails pile up and clutter your inbox. After using these codes one time, they have no useful purpose. In iOS 17, iPadOS 17, and macOS Sonoma, Apple added a feature that automatically deletes such texts and emails after they've been auto-filled on the login or verification screen. Welcome to Ellen's Tips for iOS, where I help seniors master their iPhones and iPads. If you find the video helpful, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let's get started. The verification code feature is turned off by default. Here's how you want to turn it on. Now, the first thing you want to remember is that you're going to need to be updated to iOS or iPadOS 17 or on a Mac Mac OS Sonoma. And now we will go ahead and we'll open up the settings app. 
locate, so scroll down and tap on passwords, it's either going to use Face ID or Touch ID. And now you'll want to go ahead and tap on Password Options. And then you're going to come down and toggle on the switch that says Clean Up Automatically. And now anytime you receive a verification code, it will automatically be deleted once that code is inserted with autofill. Note, the first time your iPhone auto-deletes a verification code, you may receive a pop-up asking, automatically delete verification code after use. Tap on delete, and your iPhone will handle these texts going forward. To set this up on your Mac, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to come into the settings area. So you're going to tap on the Apple in the upper left-hand corner of your Mac. You're going to tap on system settings. Once system settings opens up, scroll down until you see passwords. Put in your uh, Mac code. And then you'll tap on password options and you'll toggle on the switch that says clean up automatically. Important thing to remember is that deleting verification codes only works with auto-filled codes. Let me explain. When you receive the verification code on your iPhone, it automatically appears above your keyboard and you can insert it with one tap. This feature has been around for several years, but iOS 17, iPadOS 17, and macOS Sonoma take it a step further, and now you can even autofill codes you receive in your email when using the Apple Mail app. Deleting verification codes received in texts and emails will only be deleted if they are autofilled. So if you have an app or website that prevents your iPhone's autofill, some texts and emails will not be automatically deleted, and you will have to remove those texts and emails manually as you did before. As in other apps such as Photos, these auto-deleted texts and emails with verification codes can be found in the recently deleted folder of your trash section of messages and mail. Here's how to recover them. You'll open up the messaging app. At the very top, you'll select edit, and then you'll select show recently deleted and you'll see all of your recently deleted messages there. To recover deleted verification codes in your mail app, you wanna open Apple Mail, which I have done on my iPhone. And when I open it, it opens to all of my inboxes and I wanna be in the main mailbox section. So I'm gonna tap mailboxes in the upper left corner. And then I'm gonna locate the, um, account that I want to grab the verification codes from. So if I tap on uh, Gmail and I get on to trash, I should be able to find the verifications in there. I'm not sure why you would want to keep your verification codes. I would prefer to delete them because they can only be used one time. If for some reason you decide you want to keep these annoying verification codes, you can reverse the process simply by opening settings, tapping on passwords, unlocking either with face ID or touch ID, tap password options, and then toggle off the verification switch that says clean up automatically. This is an excellent addition to iOS and iPadOS 17 along with macOS Sonoma. It's keeping the messages and mail free of those annoying verification codes. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Any comments? 
Okay. Um, the next video is how to properly, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> is how to record the screen on your Mac in one minute. Um, this is a Gary video, and just the fact that he's doing it in one minute is unusual. Hi, this is Gary with MacBose.com. Here's the correct way to record the screen on your Mac. So if you are ever asked by somebody to record your screen, perhaps to get tech support, don't hold up your iPhone and record it with the camera. Instead, on your Mac, hold down Command, Shift, and then 5. This brings up the screen recording controls here. Select this button here for recording the entire screen. Under Options, check to see where this screen recording will be saved to. You can always choose any location you like. Also, look to see if Show Floating Thumbnail is checked. And then you'll see this icon here indicating that you're now recording the screen. Perform the action that you want to record, and then when you're done, click here again, and it'll stop recording and appear as a floating thumbnail at the bottom right. You can click that to review it and even trim the footage. When you click done, it will appear in the location that you specified, in this case, the desktop. You could also have just waited a few seconds for the floating thumbnail to disappear, and it would automatically save here. Now you've got a video file that you can post online or share with somebody. So I think most of us know about uh, that button and um, being able to select uh, <clears throat> what part of the screen you're saving. But what I didn't know was that little icon up in the top menu on the right, which indicated recording. Peter, yeah. was this was this from the subscription service? No, this was a uh, a regular. Uh, no, it was, it was public. Oh, okay, because I saw it said copyright on the bottom yeah, at the it, end. It, yeah, it was one of his regular MacMost videos. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So um, if you're in a situation where you've forgotten your iPhone's password, this it's probably not a common occurrence, but a pretty devastating one if it happens. There is something you can do about it. And this is an Apple support film. It's unusual in that it's a bit lengthier, but it's telling you what to do under different iOSs and, and on the Mac, I believe. So at any rate, let's go ahead and get started with it. If you forgot your passcode and are unable to unlock your iPhone, you can reset your iPhone to remove the passcode lock and then restore it from a backup later. We'll show you how to reset your iPhone wirelessly if you're using iOS 17. We'll also show you how to reset your iPhone wirelessly if you're using an earlier version of iOS and how to reset it using a computer. To restore your device, you'll need to have a backup already stored in iCloud or on your computer before you reset your device wirelessly, you'll need to know your Apple ID and password, and your iPhone must be connected to the internet using Wi-Fi or cellular data. First, we'll show you how to reset your iPhone wirelessly using iOS 17. If you've entered your passcode incorrectly too many times, your device will be disabled and there will be an option to reset your iPhone in the bottom right corner of the screen. To do this, tap Forgot Passcode, then tap Start iPhone Reset. All content and settings on your iPhone, including the passcode, will be erased. If you have a backup saved in iCloud or on your computer, you can restore your content when the process finishes. To proceed, enter your Apple ID password when prompted. If your iPhone has an eSIM, you'll be asked if you'd like to keep your eSIM or delete it. Both options will erase all content on your iPhone. However, if you delete your eSIM, you'll need to contact your carrier to set up a new one. Now, the process of resetting your iPhone will begin, which might take a moment. Once it's been erased, 
the Hello screen will appear. You can then follow the prompts to restore your iPhone from a backup if you have one. Now we'll show you how to reset your iPhone wirelessly using iOS 16 or earlier. If you've entered your passcode incorrectly too many times, your device will be disabled and there will be an option to erase your iPhone in the bottom right corner of the screen. To do this, tap Erase iPhone. This will erase all content and settings on your iPhone, including the passcode. If you have a backup saved in iCloud or on your computer, you can restore your content when the process is complete. If your iPhone has an eSIM, your eSIM will be deleted and you'll need to contact your carrier to set up a new one. To continue, tap Erase iPhone again and then enter your Apple ID password when prompted. Now the process of erasing your iPhone will begin. This might take a little while. Once it's been erased, the hello screen will appear. You can then follow the prompts to restore your iPhone from a backup if you have one. If you can't reset your iPhone wirelessly, you can reset it with recovery mode and a computer. To use this option, you'll need a Mac or Windows computer and a compatible cable. Your iPhone will need to be powered on and plugged into your computer. If your iPhone has Find My enabled, you'll need to make sure you have your Apple ID and password ready. First, you'll perform a few steps on your iPhone to enter recovery mode. The steps will vary depending on what model of iPhone you have. Once you've entered recovery mode, you'll use your computer to reset it. If you have an iPhone 10 or later, a second generation iPhone SE or later, an iPhone 8 or an iPhone 8 Plus, press and hold the side button and one of the volume buttons until the power off slider appears. Drag the slider to turn off your device. Now press and hold the side button and immediately connect your device to your computer while holding the button. Make sure to keep holding the side button until the recovery mode screen appears. This might take a moment. If you have an iPhone 7 or an iPhone 7 Plus, press and hold the side button or the top button until the power off slider appears. Then drag the slider to turn off your device. Now press and hold the volume down button and immediately connect your device to your computer while holding the button. Make sure to keep holding the volume down button until the recovery mode screen appears. This might take a moment. If you have a first generation iPhone SE or an iPhone 6S or earlier, press and hold the side or top button until the power off slider appears. Next, Drag the slider to turn off your device. Then press and hold the home button and immediately connect your device to your computer while holding the button. Make sure to keep holding the home button until the recovery mode screen appears. This might take a moment. Now you'll complete the process using your computer. If you have a Mac using Mac OS Catalina or later, open the Finder. If you're using Mac OS Mojave or earlier, open iTunes. If you're using a Windows computer, open iTunes or Apple devices. You might be prompted to confirm that you want to connect your iPhone to your Mac. Click Allow to continue. When the option to restore or update your device appears, click Restore. This will erase all settings and content, including the passcode. If you have a backup saved to your computer or iCloud, you can restore it after this process is done. Click Restore and Update when you're ready and follow the prompts. Your computer will download and install the latest available version of iOS on your iPhone. During this process, you might be asked to review and accept the terms and conditions. Click Agree to continue. If the download takes longer than 15 minutes, your device will exit recovery mode. To re-enter recovery mode, 
you'll need to repeat the button presses on your iPhone described in the previous section of this video. Be sure not to disconnect your device while it's restoring. When the process is finished, your iPhone will restart and the hello screen will appear. You can then follow the prompts to restore your iPhone from a backup if you have one. If you still need help, contact Apple support to speak with an advisor or make an appointment at an Apple store or Apple authorized service provider. To learn more about your Apple devices, subscribe to the Apple support YouTube channel or click another video to keep watching. Some sequences in this video were shortened. That was excellent. Yeah, that one ought to stay in the archives on the BBS for people who get in trouble later, you know, later on in life. Right. That's there, really a good one. There are a couple points important for people <laughs> not all that uh, into iPhone or Apple or whatever. Uh, first, it's really important that you know your Apple ID and it should be saved, I, I think, in writing in some absolutely secure place. Um, if, if you forget the how to uh, operate, you know, get into your phone, I imagine forgetting your Apple ID is an easy thing to do, but that's, that's critical for making this work. The second thing is you need a backup or there won't be anything to restore. Are there any other comments? Okay. Uh, this next video is by Greg Wyatt. Why your iPhone stops charging at 80%, about two minutes long. If you've left your iPhone plugged in overnight, only to find it at 80% in the morning instead of 100, you were probably left frustrated and wondering why. Well, there are a few potential reasons, starting with temperature. If your iPhone overheats, it can not only slow down performance and reduce screen brightness, but it can also stop charging completely in an attempt to cool down the device. If these precautions fail, the phone will simply shut down. So if you've left your iPhone charging in direct sunlight or under a pillow where air can't circulate, it may overheat and pause charging. This is even more likely to happen if you're charging wirelessly since it generates more heat than a traditional cable. Either way, you'll know if your device became too hot to charge if you see this message, which says that charging was put on hold due to high temperature. But when this happens, your iPhone will typically end up at a random charge level, like 74 or 87%, rather than 80% exactly. An iPhone that always stops at 80 likely has a battery protection feature enabled that can be turned off. It's called optimized battery charging, which pauses your phone's charge level at 80% until you're likely to begin using it. That means iPhone will try to learn your daily charge routine and finish charging the battery past 80% right before you're scheduled to take it off the charger. This feature was initially added to extend the battery's limited lifespan, but in many cases, it just annoyed users who wanted their phone to be fully charged as quickly as possible. If this sounds like you, then the feature can be turned off in the battery health and charging settings under charging optimization. Now, iPhone 15 models have their own hard battery limit that other models don't. It's also listed under charging optimization and prevents the device from ever exceeding 80%. This should help extend the battery's lifespan even further, although it can also be turned off. So while you can force your iPhone to charge to 100%, you'd be better off long-term leaving it at 80% if it's enough to get you through the day. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and if you want to learn how I make videos like these, let me know by tapping the link in the comments. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm busy trying to stop my video so I can get on the screen. At any rate, are there any comments? Uh, thank you. I didn't realize that, or if I'd heard it, I forgot it. Thank you. Oh, max out at 80. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? Okay. Um, 
Our next video is also about two minutes long. It's by David A. Cox, and it's an iPhone trick that could save your life. So let's have a look. Hey folks, today I'm gonna to teach you a potentially life-saving iPhone tip that is quick to set up and simple to use. Let's dive in. Sometimes in an emergency situation, you might need to quickly and discreetly send a message to a loved one, letting them know that you're in danger, your GPS coordinates, let them know that they should not reply, but they should act immediately. That's a lot of information that you need to effectively communicate quickly while under a state of duress. This is where a clever use of the iPhone's text replacement feature comes in handy. On your iPhone, I want you to go into settings and then scroll down and tap on general. Now tap on keyboard followed by text replacement. And finally, here I want you to tap the plus symbol at the top right. Here where it says phrase, you can copy and paste this from the video description. Emergency alert. I am discreetly sending this automated message because I'm in immediate danger and unable to speak or respond. Urgent help is needed. Please do not reply to this message, but do act promptly. My current location is. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, why does it just simply end with my current location is? Here's the reason why. If you're in a text message and you type in the words, my current location is, it gives you a one tap option to send your GPS coordinates. That's why the phrase ends with that. Now here where it says shortcut, I recommend that you pick a letter and triple it. For this example, I'm gonna use the letter H for help. So now if you're ever in an emergency situation, just type HHH followed by the space bar. Now tap current location, now tap send followed by the blue arrow. If you learned something new in this video, don't forget to click the like button. And keep in mind, if you ever need help with your Apple devices, something that I've come to refer to as tech therapy, you can schedule a one hour session with me on my website at techtalkamerica.com. Thank you so much for watching everyone. This is David A. Cox with Tech Talk America, class dismissed. Wonder what he charges for an hour. Yeah, indeed. Um, wait, question. <laughs> Sorry, where is that thing? Question. We can, we can hear you. Oh. Okay, thanks. Uh, is there a good way to get GPS? Do I do it through text? I'm kind of monitoring streams, and when I see trash, it wants my uh, not GPS. Sorry, my you know lat long coordinates. I, I just tried to put in the text my current location is, but it's not addressed to anybody. I, nothing came up. I'm on 17.3. I might be able to help you with that, Sharon. Okay, later. This, this is Peter. Uh, for some Thanks. reason, I'm no longer showing up on the screen, but- You're there. You can hear me, good. I can, I can see you too. Yeah, that's uh, my current location is, this kind of magical uh, language in text. And it will, um, as uh, David A. Cox says, produce that kind of GPS map location. But you need to have location oh. shared on okay. with whoever it is that you're texting to. Uh, uh, yeah. And with, with the modern phones, uh, one option is to have it on uh, indefinitely. So if you're really considering having an emergency text message stored away that you would tap three letters to get it sent off, um, then indefinitely would be the way to set it up. Uh, sorry, that was in settings general. General? Um, what you can try doing is uh, just go to uh, texts and type in my current location is. Yeah. And see if you can get that uh, current location button to appear. Oh, uh, it just says select autofill or select all. Yeah, there there are a lot of other little things that can happen. Oh, I actually- Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, wait. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. I, I didn't know how I got there, but I saw it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I decided I would try this to set it up to see if I could get it to go to my wife's iPhone. 
And it took me about two or three tries to get everything right so that it was working. But it will work. Thank you. Oh, check it. You can also, um, maybe not for this purpose, but you can also always ask Siri, where am I? Oh, you thank also, you, Benji. You can right. also, you can also <laughs> type, you. where am I in any browser? And Google will tell you where you are, show you where you are in the map. Yeah. Uh, maybe Rather not than... Maybe not GPS coordinates, but... Um, not GPS, uh, but lat long. Uh, yeah, something tell like me that. The, I, I frequently ask, well, when I'm driving in an unfamiliar location, yeah. I'll sometimes just ask Siri, where am I? And it'll tell me what... Because sometimes it's hard to tell what street you're on, you know? Even <laughs> you're crossing intersections, and you can see the signs of the cross streets, but sometimes on major streets, they don't even bother to have signs to tell you what the major street is because they assume you know. Like, for instance, down the peninsula, El Camino Real, I've been on wondering what street I was on and driving block after block and seeing and none of the signs say El Camino Real. Yes, since I'm on, also still doing DoorDash. <laughs> yes, I agree. Thanks, Genji. Okay. And Peter, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, just, uh, I looked up David Cox's site. He charges a dollar, $149 an hour. Yeah, better to join DV mug, more cost effective. Um, okay, uh, there's one more video here. Um, it's by Gary Rosenwig and he, uh, ask where is the missing comma on my iPhone keyboard? Uh, this one's been reviewed by Rick and gotten his approval. So let's let's finish up the videos with it. Can't find the comma on your iPhone's keyboard? Let me show you why. Hmm. MacMos is brought to you thanks to a great group of more than a thousand supporters. Go to macbos.com slash Patreon. There, you could read more about it. Join us and get exclusive content and course discounts. So if you can't find the comma on your iPhone's keyboard, you're not alone. If you look online, there are a lot of people that say they have this problem. There are also a lot of articles and even videos that try to explain why, but they don't seem to be helping people because there are actually several different reasons why people may not find the comma on the iPhone's keyboard. And usually the one that most people are experiencing is not the solution that's being presented. Let me show you all the different reasons why you may not see the comma and either how to find it or why you don't need it. So first, say you're typing in a normal app, like here I am in the notes app, and I've got my keyboard at the bottom and notice that there's no comma key that's visible. Now, in order to get to the comma, what you would normally do is tap a little one, two, three button here at the bottom left. When you do that, you get the numbers and symbols keyboard. And one of the keys here is the comma. So now you can type the comma pretty easily. Now, if this was your problem, you simply didn't know to press the one, two, three key here to reveal the comma, well, then now you know the solution. The chances are that's not why you're asking. You probably already knew how to type a comma like this when typing normal text. Now, do note that what I'm using here is the US English keyboard. So one possible problem is that maybe you're not using the US English keyboard. Now, no matter which keyboard you're using, there should be a comma available to you as long as that's a regular character used in that language. But note there are several settings that change which keyboard is here. You've got this little glow key at the bottom left, and if you tap it, it will switch keyboards. Or if you tap and hold, it'll show you the keyboards you've got. In this case, I've got English, the emoji keyboard, and the French keyboard that I've enabled. And you can easily switch between these. So it could be that you've switched to a keyboard that doesn't have the comma key, or it's not in the location where you expect. If you go to keyboard settings, it actually jumps to the settings app and right to the keyboard section. And here you can see the keyboards I have installed. So you can see maybe you've got a different keyboard installed. Maybe you're using the wrong one in this situation. And you can figure out why the comma is missing based on that. Note that not only do you have keyboard settings here, but if you go up to the main level and down into general, you also have an area here for language and region. So depending on your settings here, you may also see different things on the keyboard. Now, if that doesn't help you find the comma on your keyboard, 
Well, I'm not too surprised because that's probably not the reason why you can't find it either. It's definitely something you should keep in mind, but chances are the problem you're experiencing is this. You're in either the mail app, messages app, or something similar where you're sending a message to someone. Let's go into the mail app here and say I'm composing a new message. Now, the important thing to realize about the keyboard is the keyboard is dynamic. It changes depending on the situation. So you're going to see different keyboards, maybe just slightly different keyboards, depending upon the app you're using and where you're typing. For instance, here in the mail app, I'm going to see a different keyboard if I'm in the to field, adding addresses here, or if I'm in the body field here where I'm typing. Using the body field, I get a keyboard that looks just like the one in notes. I get all the regular letters here, and if I tap one, two, three, I can see the comma. But if I'm typing in the to field here, then note that the keyboard changes a bit. For instance, notice I have an add symbol here that's not usually there in the standard keyboard. You have to tap the one, two, three to see the add symbol. But it's here when you're typing email addresses because, of course, every email address has to have that add symbol in it. So it makes sense to put it in a location where you can get to it easily. But if I tap one, two, three, I can see the numbers here at the top, but the symbols I see are different and it's missing the comma. So there's no way to type a comma here if you're typing an email address up here in the to field. This makes sense because a comma is not an accepted character in an email address. This isn't a restriction of the mail app. This isn't a restriction of your iPhone. This is a restriction of the internet. Email addresses cannot have certain characters. One of the characters they can't have is a comma. There's no such thing as a comma in an email address. So when you type an email address, you don't need a comma. So you can type one out like this, and you'll never need to type a comma in an email address. But wait, I know why it is that you want to use a comma. It's because you want to have more than one email address here. Typically on a computer, using a regular physical keyboard, you would type one email address, press comma, and then type another email address. And you can't do that here because there's no comma. But you don't need a comma because you don't need to separate email addresses with commas here. Instead, you could just use the return button here. If you tap return, you may think it would enter the email address and maybe go to the next field, but it doesn't. Return will finish off that email address. And then you can see I'm still typing and I can type another email address now. So you can enter one email address, return, another email address, return, and so on until you have all the email addresses that you want in the to field. You can also, of course, use the plus button here and add email addresses this way. So I could add this one here, for example, and you could see it adds it without needing to type return or comma or anything. So when typing in a to field, you can't type a comma and you don't need to type a comma because return will separate email addresses. The same thing in messages. If you start a new message conversation there and you type something here, I'll just use somebody's name and then use that, you can see I could just go and immediately start typing somebody else's name. If I'm actually typing something like a phone number like that, I don't need a comma there either. A return will finish off that phone number and I can start entering in the next phone number. So just like mail, you don't need a comma to separate these and you can't use a comma in either an email address or a phone number anyway. So there's no need to have it present in the keyboard. So there are the three reasons why you can't find the comma key on the iPhone keyboard. Either you forgot you need to press the one, two, three button to get to the numbers and symbols part of the keyboard, or perhaps you're using a specialty keyboard, maybe a third party keyboard, or just a different language keyboard where the comma is in a different location, or maybe not part of that particular language. Or you're simply typing in a space like the to field in the mail app or the messages app where the comma isn't even allowed or needed. I hope you found this useful. Thanks for watching. That was a totally new concept to me. <laughs> I, I found that very useful. I've been frustrated in the past not being able to figure out how to send multiples without going to BCC and so forth. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it was even gone. <laughs> the uh, uh, different keyboards I knew about, but uh, 
the multiple addresses was very, very helpful. <clears throat> Anything else? Boy, everybody's quiet today, aren't they? Yeah. Well, we've had we've had some responses. At any rate, it's time to begin our Q and A session, and so I'm going to stop the sharing, and we can return to that part. And so we that. will at this point uh, end the recording. So say bye bye. Anybody who's watching on YouTube, if you want to be participating in the Q&A, you need to come to the live meeting. Okay, yeah. see you next week.